Let me tell you the story behind an iOS jailbreak. More specifically, the security vulnerability, being called Sock Puppet, that was exploited for this jailbreak. I hope you will see the incredible work that goes into finding these exploits. Maybe you have seen this recent tweet by Ned Williamson. I managed to get kernel task port using CVE 2019-8605 for iOS 12.2, tested on iPhone 6S Plus. Still needs quite a bit of work for stability. Huge thanks to Bazad for his assistance in achieving a goal I've had for over a decade. First of all, congrats Ned for achieving your goals. And since Ned's tweet, you have maybe seen new jailbreak releases using what some call the sock puppet exploit. So in today's video, I want to explain what is behind the bug CVE 2019-8605. And this is only possible because Ned is so awesome that he jumped on a call to explain the bug to me. And by the way, he is also releasing an article about his research over at the Google Project Zero blog. I will make sure to link it below. So I hope you are as excited as I am. Let's head in. Let's start at the beginning. How did Ned discover this kernel bug? You should probably know that Ned is a very experienced researcher. Last year he successfully exploited Chrome 69 together with Sailo and Niklas B at hack to win A full browser exploit is of course a chain of multiple bugs and I think his main contribution was a sandbox escape and he found this bug with a special fuzzer and fuzzing methodology. Fuzzing something like an IPC mechanism is quite challenging and requires considerable engineering efforts. Earlier this year at OffensiveCon 19 he gave a talk with the title Modern Source Fuzzing. In this talk he describes his technique and approaches to fuzzing complex software stacks like the Chrome IPC. It's about source fuzzing, so you obviously have the source code for Chrome, but it's still very challenging. Just because it's open source doesn't mean it's easy to find bugs, but he was able to get his fuzzer into places where other fuzzers maybe haven't been yet. And this is absolutely relevant for this iOS exploit, because at the end of the talk he says this. Let's talk about uh, XNU real quick. So this is my uh, new project I've just started, and same exact technique, very different attack surface, and I kind of keep trying to discover like, okay, how far can I take this thing, and where does it stop working? And so I wanted to test uh, XNU networking, and so what I did was I just took the whole network subsystem of XNU, compiled it with the instrumentation for like libfuzzer and stuff, and then tried to make this little self-contained library in, in user space. And then, of course, when you go to link it, there's all the rest of the kernel missing, and so it says like, you know, a thousand functions are missing. So what I did was I just stubbed all those functions out to assert false and just crash when I called them. So that way I could start running and working with this thing and as it would hit code that it actually needed to work, I would either put that real implementation in or stub it out or put my own mocked implementation. So he announced that he was working on XNU, specifically fuzzing the networking stack. And what a surprise that CVE 2019-8605, Sock Puppet, is a bug in the XNU network stack. That's where the name comes from, sockets, network sockets. So if you are interested about his fuzzing technique to get an idea of how he did it, watch this talk and keep an eye out on his Twitter. He also wants to open source that fuzzer too. Before we head into the technical details, let me just clarify something. You might wonder how he's able to do source code fuzzing when iOS is a proprietary closed source operating system by Apple. Well, here's the official Darwin XNU repository by Apple. And they write, XNU kernel is part of the Darwin operating system for use in macOS and iOS operating systems. XNU is an acronym for Access Not Unix. XNU is a hybrid kernel combining the Mac kernel developed at Carnegie Mellon University with components from FreeBSD and a C++ API for writing drivers called IOKit. So iOS as a whole is obviously more than just XNU with a lot of closed source, but when we talk about kernel bugs and kernel exploits, then you can do research on the open source parts of XNU. And Ned was targeting the network stack. So what did his father find? Let's have a look at this original report in the Google Project Zero bug tracker. This was mid-March. Issue 1806. XNU, use after free due to a stale pointer left by IN6 PCB detach. 
When we take a look at the proof of concept code he has attached here, we see that he is creating a raw socket. Raw sockets are very low level and allow you to craft any kind of network packet, any kind of protocol. And so it's kind of risky to allow regular users or regular programs to do that. Normal users shouldn't need to do that anyway because you can specifically create TCP sockets instead for when you want to do stuff like an HTTP request. TCP sockets are on a higher layer, they are fine. This means his original report wouldn't be usable for an iOS jailbreak because you would need root privileges. Maybe this is also the reason why it was initially reported with severity high and not severity critical. You can only attack the kernel when you are already root. But roughly two months after this initial report in mid-May, he tweeted, When I reported the CVE, I could only reproduce it on macOS with root user. That's what we just learned. Raw sockets require root privileges. But I found a way to reach it from the app sandbox on iOS. Don't update needlessly while I continue to investigate. So let's hop on the call with Ned and let him introduce the variant of the bug that can be triggered as a regular user. Right, so here, here's the, the minimal test case pretty much. Uh, and so the interesting thing is my fuzzer produced this exactly as is. Um, I just added prints to help test on iOS, but basically I have this protobuf message that describes all the types of syscalls and the type of arguments they can have. And this is exactly what came out of it. What he says here about the protobuf messages has to do with his fuzzer. If you watch his talk from earlier, you will know about it. Protocol buffers are from Google and used for serializing structured data. Think XML, but smaller, faster, and simpler. And he uses protobuf to basically define the building blocks the fuzzer can use. In this case, his fuzzer is creating syscalls, because syscalls are what you as a user can use from userland if you want to talk to the kernel. So any kernel exploit usually means you call naughty syscalls. And here in his code, you can see socket and set socket options and disconnect X, which are all syscalls. Um, I looked at it and I realized that it created this socket. It created this uh, TCP socket. Then it enabled this option that lets you set socket opt after disconnecting. And if you wonder how he found this new variant, he told me that after improving the protobuf grammar for his fuzzer, specifically to improve the set socket opt syscall, his father found this. And so about three months after the initial report in mid-June, he tweeted, I've just found sonpx set opt shut, which lets you call set socket opt after a socket has been shut down. I missed this earlier. So you can see it took quite a while even for him to really understand the bug. To take it from a crash triggered as root to something that can be called not only from user but also from inside the app sandbox on iOS. The app sandbox has more restrictions on the syscalls you can call. And he also briefly mentions here the underlying functionality that caused an issue. Sonpx set opt shut, which is a flag you can enable in the socket options, lets you call set socket opt after a socket has been shut down. Quick refresher of his original bug title. Use after free due to stale pointer left by in6 PCB detach. Internet 6, so IPv6, PCB protocol control block detach. So detaching, disconnecting a socket. And somehow there was a stale pointer that could be abused in a use after free. Use after free means that some code freed an object in memory and then another part still used it. Use after freed. Which means instead of the original object, there could now be random data there and it might crash because of that. Or with some heap grooming, you can maybe control exactly the data that is there. And that could lead to an exploit. Okay, so now I hope you have somewhat of an idea where the journey is going. Now let's Ned take over again. Anyways, uh, let me actually try to pull up the bug. So it's in 6 pcbc and it's gonna be, uh, yep, I, somehow, I guess I searched for it last time. There's kind of the programming error and then there's how it manifests. So the programming error is that Basically down here, when, when we're um, detaching this TCP session from a socket, then we try to free all the, the information related to whatever we were doing before we disconnected. And so you'll see here like, okay, let's free the buffer containing our some, set, some type of options and then we null it out. And then we free this here. If we had some options set, we free them and null them out, free null, free null. So you might notice that there's a, 
kind of a pattern here of it looks like we intend to use these again later because we're nulling them out. So, or at least that should be a hint that it's, it's probably possible. Otherwise, if we were just destroying this object, there would be no need to null anything out. We just have to free it. So the problem is here. So yeah, so we can see like, okay, if we had IPv6 options, so if it's not null, we'll go ahead and delete everything and then free this buffer. But then the problem is we didn't actually clear this thing. So this should have been set to null. And the problem is if we can keep using the socket after it's been destroyed and access this pointer, it will have been freed by this function, but you know we can continue to interact with it. Yeah, so it's tricky, right? And so the interesting thing is how you continue to interact with it. All right, let me try to recap the back with my words. Let's say you have the struct A, which can hold struct B and C. When you want to use it, you first malloc the size for A, malloc returns a pointer, so the address to the memory that we can use for it now, and we remember it in var A. And then we can access B and C and malloc them as well. So malloc returns the address where we have space for B and C. Now, when you are done with using A, you have to make sure you free everything properly. So you free B and C, and afterwards you free A. Perfect. This would be an option, and this is how Ned originally thought of as the socket options. However, it turns out that socket options can be reused. So what if we would want to reuse A? Then we would just free B and C, but leave var A alone. Now, if we would design our program that it would just alloc B and C again once we need it, it would be fine. But in larger applications, especially how it is designed here, we actually check if B and C is set. And only if they are not set, then we allocate new memory for B and C. But if you want to do that, you need to make sure to null the pointer when you free the object. Freeing the object just tells the heap allocator that the memory can be used for something else, but the pointer to the memory still is stored in BNC. So this here would be a use after free situation. Even though we freed the memory, this check here sees a pointer stored in BNC, thus not allocated again, and it will be used as nothing happened. That's why there was this pattern of free null, free null. All the inner options are freed and then nulled, freed and then nulled. So the problem is here. So yeah, so we can see like, okay, if we had IPv6 options, so if it's not null, we'll go ahead and delete everything and then free this buffer. But then the problem is we didn't actually clear this thing. So this should have been set to null. Every other option is properly freed and nulled, except the in6p output opts. It is as if we did properly set B to null after the free, but we forgot to null C. Thus, C could lead to a use after free. And the problem is if we can keep using the socket after it's been destroyed and access this pointer, it will have been freed by this function, but you know we can continue to interact with it. So now let's look at the proof of concept again. We create an IPv6 TCP socket. Then we prepare the socket options with the special flag sonpx set opt shut enabled. That will allow us to reuse the same socket options. And then we actually set this option onto the socket S with set socket opt. From the man page, we know that this means to manipulate options at the socket's API level, level is specified as sol socket. This is followed by a second call to set socket opt, but this time specifically to set the IPv6 options. And here he just changed the min MTU size to minus one. The min MTU value doesn't really have significance other than maybe being a simple option. I think he just wants to set any IPv6 output option to trigger the allocation of this IPv6 output option struct. This thing actually creates a IPv6 option. So when you set that, it'll see, oh, that pointer is null. Let me allocate a struct representing the options. And then I'll go ahead and set uh, this min MTU value. Then comes the disconnect. This disconnect is what actually triggers the free that we saw. We disconnect the socket with disconnect X. This is actually a weird syscall. Probably Ned was also surprised to learn that this exists. Because of the history of X and U, it shares a lot of the syscalls with, for example, Linux or, or I guess Unix. Socket and setsoc opt are syscalls you might even know. But disconnect X is non-standard. It's not part of POSIX. It's a weird unique syscall for X and U. This will trigger the free of the inner option as Ned has explained. But that single option that IPv6 options for outgoing packets in 6p output opts 
was not nulled. Now we call setsoc again. Um, and then normally this setsoc opt would say, oh, hey, this socket is already disconnected. Um, I'm not going to set an option for you. But because this thing up here was turned on, and this is a thing that the fuzzer found, uh, which I had missed doing during my manual review of the bug, it actually generated this struct data completely from scratch. So I actually made it look cleaner, but it was just generating a buffer here and you know feeding this buffer and size in. And so it found that there was this option called set opt shut that lets you keep setting options after you've um, disconnected. So that means that we can keep getting and setting to that struct that was freed. And so from that, we just basically have a read and a write on a freed struct object, which is really powerful. So calling set sock opt on the same socket reuses the previous socket option. In this case, we want to change the min MTU value again. This means we take the socket options and then we would follow the pointer into the IPv6 output options. But that pointer is dangling and might now point into other memory. And now writing the min MTU value into this other memory could corrupt data. But you don't know what and the kernel might crash or never crash. However, when you use something like the address sanitizer option on your build, then this debug feature would catch this attempted write into freed memory. And so that's why the fuzzer found that calling setsoc opt again will trigger this address sanitizer crash. But when we think about exploiting this, we maybe want to consider what happens when we do get sock opt, so get the socket options, to get, for example, the current min MTU value. That would also follow the dangling pointer, read the min MTU value, but because it is now pointing into old memory, it could read whatever. When we get these IPv6 options, basically reading that data straight out of the, the op. So this is the freed thing. We can just read this, this field from it. This is the thing that's used after freed, right? So the dangling pointer thinks it's pointing into memory that has this structured object, but it got freed. So there is random data at all these fields now. Or if you can control what will be exactly there by spraying allocating objects in the kernel, then maybe you can exactly control what values are here. So you can see all these fields. We can um, set and get them after this whole object has been freed. So if we do a heap spray and reclaim this object with controlled data, then you can imagine that we can, we can get this integer and it will just read the integer back to us. And then we can see whatever we sprayed there. So we know that our spray succeeded. So that's the basic idea of use after free. Before accessing the dangling pointer again, you just somehow spam allocations of other data in memory. And you carefully chose that data so that if you get lucky and the pointer points into your data, you can control every field. And as a fairly safe test to see if it worked, you can always spam the memory, then read this integer with get socket opt and check if it's what you expected. If a random object happened to be there instead, you would see, yeah, not my value and try again. And maybe next time you get lucky. And then over here, we can just replace one of the pointers. So we keep spraying until we see that this matches a known value. And then we can get, and it will actually access the pointer here. And because we know the spray succeeded, we have some controlled pointer there and we can actually read arbitrary memory. And then, you know, by the same idea, if we reclaim this and then we set, I think it's actually packet info is what I used. So we can get this to read 20 bytes of this fake packet info pointer. It will just read it straight back to us in user land. So we can also set this thing. And if we set it to null bytes, it will actually free this buffer. So you can't really set arbitrary bytes, but um, because you can free this really easily, you know, arbitrary read and arbitrary free is already a nice, really nice primitive. So I was actually surprised about that. There is a use after free and you could fake socket options which contain pointers you control. And now you want to somehow abuse this. I would have thought being able to control those pointers, you can somehow easily get arbitrary read and write. But it seems like the socket output options struct is not super perfect and that was only able to find this arbitrary read with get socket opt and an arbitrary free. I think this should be the place for the free. If you somehow trigger this clearing of options and that pointer is set, it will call free on it. So we can free any allocated memory in the kernel we want. But I was still looking through the code myself to better understand what you can control with the initial use after free and actually ran across this line here. 
This is a mem copy from a buffer you control into the packet info. That looks like an arbitrary write. But actually, Ned was talking about it during our call, and I had forgotten about it. Only when I rewatched the footage, I noticed it. So here is Ned talking about a few of the options you have with the use after free. So if we look at, I think it's this function. Yeah, IP6 set packet up. So here's where we set packet options. So this is the free thing, right? The opt, the IP6 packet mm -hmm. opts. So what happens is, um, here's packet info. So when we go to set it, and you'll see that these other ones are really constrained. So we can write an integer between zero and 255 here. You know, that's not that useful. Or, ne you know, negative one, 255. We, we have these really highly constrained writes into this struct. And then for the other things that involve, like taking a pointer that we've controlled and writing to it, you can see here, there's actually a root check. So this is no good from the user land sandbox. Basically, the only thing we can really call with any complexity to set something here is this packet info. The interesting thing is, um, so when I first looked at this, it looked like, okay, as long as I can bypass some of these checks here, um, I'll actually be able to B copy straight into this thing. Like it looks great, but it turned out that this sticky thing will be turned on in the normal case with packet info. So you have to pass this 2292 packet info through, you have to go through this like old mbuff based packet options, like, like a socket option setting mechanism. And it turned out that that had some of its own checks in it. So we couldn't get here with controlled data anyways. So it doesn't, doesn't really matter, but moral of the story is it looks like we can write arbitrary stuff here, but um, in reality, the only thing we can really hit is this guy. And this is extremely easy to hit. So basically, if if we don't specify an IPv6 address, um, and that's just null bytes, and then we also don't have an interface index of zero. So essentially, if this whole struct is all null bytes, then we can hit this thing no problem. And that is the function I just showed you earlier. That will lead to this arbitrary free. This means if you know the address of some other object the kernel uses, you can force it to be freed which is basically a targeted use after free for anything you want. And then you can do a heap spray for that and control that structure. And that structure can be the holy grail. And thus, this arbitrary free primitive can be turned into something very powerful. This is awesome. I really learned a lot from this. Now, this is of course not the whole exploit. This is just the bug itself explained. So the question that you should have now are, first, how do you actually spray objects in kernel memory? malloc is of course allocating in user land and there is no kernel alloc syscall. So you need to abuse something else to allocate buffers for you. And second, what do you do with the arbitrary free? What other kernel object do you target and how do you find it in the kernel memory to point your control pointer to? If you are curious about all of this, make sure to follow Ned on Twitter and also check the description of this video. I will make sure to link the related stuff. And otherwise, thanks to everybody on Patreon for supporting the making of these kind of videos. And it would mean a lot to me if you share this video with your colleagues and friends or internet strangers.